Now, I, I, I do recognize that I'm what stands between you and adult beverages. So I'll do my best to uh, get you out of here as close to on time as humanly possible. Well, thanks for hanging out with me. I appreciate it. My name is Nate Chuda. I work for Pivotal. I am an architect, advocate type person. I actually had somebody tell me earlier this year that you're like an architect as a service. And I thought, well, that's kind of cool. But then I sounded out the acronym. And then I went, wait a minute. That might not have been a compliment. So I sort of feel obligated to, to point this out. If you're interested in the architecture topic at all, I wrote this ebook earlier this year. It's free. You know, have at it. My wife, I think, lovingly refers to it as a pamphlet because it, it is relatively short. You know, so and I, at least I think she means it lovingly. I don't know. I actually got my hands on a dead tree copy a couple of weeks ago, and I happened to show it to her. And she says, "Oh, isn't that cute? You know, look, it's it's this thin little thing." I'm like, "I know, but how many books have you written, honey?" So. Well, let's talk about the cloud, shall we? It's pretty clear if you've been in our space over the last few years, you've probably had something to do with the cloud one way, shape, or form, and you start to realize there's a lot of options when it comes to that. For so many people, you say cloud native and they think microservices. I need to refactor my entire application to a series of microservices. Or you know what, that kind of hurts, so we're gonna do a modular monolith. I certainly run into a lot of people who are, you know what, I'm gonna put everything in a Docker container because containers are the answer to all my problems. And of course, now people are getting very excited about serverless. I actually had somebody fairly recently within the last couple of months say, I'm going to refactor my entire application as a series of functions. And I had to bite my tongue because I'm like, what I'd really like to tell you is that's an incredibly bad idea. You know, there are probably a few applications in the world where that actually makes sense, where it truly is just a set of functions. That, I would argue, is the exception, not the norm. All right, so now a lot of people are very excited about functions as a service because, of course, everything is as a service, and so that's getting people very excited. And you may look around and go, well, hang on a sec here. We just finally refactored our application to cloud-native microservices, and we went through some 12-factor stuff, and we forklifted, and, and now you're telling me i got to throw that away and, and, and make a whole bunch of functions? I mean, that makes me kind of grumpy. You know, that's not what I want to do. I've already done all this work. Don't make me do it again. Or, or perhaps you're more old school and you prefer this particular approach. When I built this slide, my wife looked at it and she said, what is that? I said, it's table flip. She's like, what? I said, yeah, see, table's upside down, arms in the air, table flip. I don't know if this is a good or a bad thing, but I actually have that as a shortcut, as a keyboard expander. So I just like type a couple things and pfft, out shows that bad boy. Please don't throw away your code quite yet. Believe me, we can actually leverage quite a bit of it. And what I hope you take out of this presentation, and I'll hammer on this point towards the end, they're all just tools. That's all we're talking about here. The challenge for us is knowing when do we use which tool. These aren't or conversations. I'm gonna use this or that. They're and conversations. And, and the challenge for us you know, the art, the design, the architecture aspects of this is when should we use a function? When should we use a container? When should we use a platform? All right now, I'm gonna do a little level setting here and kind of walk us through the history, like how did we get to this point? I don't feel like our industry does a particularly good job of appreciating history. Now, I have this theory that for most developers, time begins with the first language they learned and nothing preceded that. You know, and you see these things repeat. You see these cycles come again and again. We change the names to protect the innocent and the guilty. And then we wonder, oh, this is something brand new. No one's ever done this before. And you realize, well, actually, it's kind of like that thing we used to do. We just changed it a little bit. Like my favorite example of that right now is cloud. So a generic definition of cloud would be I have a big pool of compute and I give you a slice of it and I charge you for what you use. Does that sound like any technology we've ever used in the history of computing? It sounds like a mainframe, doesn't it? Now, let's be honest. It's a very different implementation. But conceptually, the mainframe is a big pile of compute, and I give you a slice of it, and I charge you for what you use. So we kind of reinvent the wheel and rename it, and, and on we go. So a lot of this began with IaaS, and, and I can remember at my previous organization, this was where we first started kind of dipping a toe into the cloud. And it's been really fascinating to see how infrastructure has changed in our industry. You know, I've seen this massive shift in my career. When I first started as a software developer, servers were these homegrown entities. They were bespoke artisanal things. And that might be fantastic for like a sandwich. I don't want that in my software. That's not a good thing. And I remember back in the era where we 
almost got to the point where you'd be ordering the parts yourself and hand assembling them. And, and if you needed a server, you needed to plan well in advance because it would take weeks, if not months, for that server to be available to you. And, and this is always kind of a, a fun exercise. Think back, what was the longest you ever had to wait from I need this server to here you go, here's the keys, you can play with it now. Now I'm sure everybody can go longer than a month. How about longer than three months? Six. We'll get there. Six months, who can go longer than six months? How about nine, who's got nine? I feel a little bit like an auctioneer now. How about 12, anybody wanna beat 12? I had that experience once. We asked for a development database. Development database, not even a prod database. Just a little baby one. I didn't need it sharded or anything crazy like that. It took a year. I still to this day have no idea what took a year. I assume they wrote their own database as part of this request. I don't know. <laughs> now, unfortunately for us, that meant as architects, as senior technical people, we had to make decisions really early on in the process when we knew nothing. So a very typical question that you'd have to grapple with beginning of a project, so how much capacity do you think you're gonna need? And of course, the only honest answer we could give is I have no idea. Because it's too early, I don't know, maybe it's a hit product and we're gonna have hundreds of thousands of concurrent users or maybe it'll flop over and you know, it's not gonna work so great. And so what would most of us do? We, we do some kind of mental modeling, right? We, we kind of come up with what is the worst case scenario and then we would double it and then we'd add a little more and then maybe we'd double that again just, just to be safe. Because it was much, much harder to ask for stuff later, so we just asked for everything up front. And what this translated to is we would have low single digit utilization numbers. And we were okay with that because, well, the alternatives weren't great. Although let's be honest, we were charging our customers for unused capacity. That's not wonderful either. And so every experience I had here was pretty negative. You'd be looking at like a minimum six week, which really means six month lead time. And you'd have to fill out a bunch of tickets and you'd never fill out the tickets right. And they'd go to the wrong group. And then you'd have to f figure that out. And you'd spend a lot of time in meetings and there'd be lots of email back and forth. And then there'd be more follow up and more meetings and more tickets. And so when we were done with all this, we felt pretty attached to these servers. And so we gave them pithy names. I worked at one organization where we, we named all our servers after Simpsons characters. You know, that was a fairly common thing back in the day. And so we literally would treat these things like pets, right? So these are my pets. This is Han and Chewie. These are my little kitty cats. And I'm fairly confident that we're either of these little fur balls to get sick my family would implore me to spend almost limitless money to make them better because they're essentially members of the family. And, and I gotta be honest with you, I, I wouldn't mind being a house cat if I had a choice because I'm convinced these guys pretty much have everything they could possibly want. You know, attention when you want it, limitless food, you can sleep like 20 hours a day. I'm really having a hard time finding the downside of that gig. And, and so we think back to this era when our servers were pets and we would do whatever it takes to make them happy and healthy because we spent so much time building them, so much time getting them up and running. It's like, we have to keep going with this, do whatever it takes to get this thing patched. And of course, another interesting side effect of this era is these servers were a heavily constrained resource and they were a very, very expensive resource. And so it was implored upon us by our financial people to make sure we get our money's worth out of this expensive piece of hardware. And so this is why we created things like app servers. And so the goal here was put as many apps as possible on that server so that we can maximize the ROI. That's a win for the CFO. But of course, there's some downsides to putting 10 or 15 or 20 apps on a single server. Now all of a sudden we've got shared resources. And I've seen a lot of instances in my career where applications assumed they were gonna be installed alongside another application. And since that application had something it needed, they didn't have to package it with their application because it was already there, which works right up until the moment that you put it on a fresh server and I'm sorry, I didn't know you had this dependency with the Wombat system, oops. Now, of course, you've all had this wonderful experience where someone else has a programming issue and your server goes down on Monday morning. Why? Well, because. I've seen this multiple times. One of the, my favorite examples, we came in on a Monday morning our app was down, most of the apps on the server were down, except for the one that put in a mime type change over the weekend. That app was fine. Everybody else was down, down. And it's like, wait a minute, how did we not catch this in any of the preceding regions? How did we miss this? I still have no idea. This is not a fun place to be. 
The other really painful side effect is now I have to coordinate changes with a host of applications that are all moving at a different rate. So I'm a long time Java developer and more than one time in my career, I've really wanted to be on like the next version of Java, but I'm sorry, you can't have nice things because we have this really old legacy application and they can't upgrade ever. So you're stuck on the lowest common denominator. I had an application once, we wanted to use the new strategic single sign-on solution and I was told it would be available like May or June. What they didn't bother to tell me was eventually the people who were in charge of our servers were gonna say we make no changes until the entire fleet has been upgraded to the next version of the operating system. And so instead of my application going to production on the new single sign-on solution, I had to build in a tactical approach that lasted more than a year because it turns out it takes a long time to convert a thousand servers. And so we're stuck in this situation where I'm sorry, you can't have that until everybody else is willing to make that move, ready to make that move. And you're always waiting for that slowest person, that slowest application. And quite frankly, this is why for so many of our organizations, currency was something that we sort of shifted to the side because it was this painful 18 month period of, I'm sorry, customers, you don't get anything new. You don't get any features. We're not gonna fix any bugs. In fact, we're gonna create all sorts of new ones. And we're all gonna be frustrated by this. No one's happy at the end of a currency project. No one's like, yay, let's go have cake. And so for a lot of our organizations, we just looked at that and said, no way, we're not doing it. We're gonna stay on the current version. It's fine, right up until you have an Equifax-like hack. And then you go, oops, that was a bad idea. Now, thinking through this actually reminds me of that fairly famous Yoda quote. You know, fear is the path to the dark side. Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering. I mean, I had no idea there was such a thing as Yoda Ops, but I'm pretty sure there is. Now, of course, in this era of software, what we were doing, we were moving code from one instance of an app server to a completely different instance of the app server. And so everyone in this room has at one point in their career had this wonderful experience where, well, it worked in dev, but not in test. Or it worked in test, but not in QA, or it worked in QA, but not in main, or whatever regions are, you run into this situation where it worked in one and not the other. And then you inevitably have to ask this question, why? Which generally leads you down the path of, why did I get into this industry? There has to be a better way to make a living. Because the environments are the same, right? I mean, they're supposed to be identical. It's the same app server, it's the same operating system. It just happens to be a slightly different piece of hardware located in a slightly different part of our data center, so what? The worst example of this that I have had in my career Everything was at the same patch level, but the patches has been applied in a different order. I mean, this is literally where you're just like flipping tables and you're just like, seriously? I mean, why do I do this to myself? I mean, this is fundamentally why I keep my hair short because then I can't like grab onto it and yank it out. Now, things have shifted though. When we started to see this, you know, already 10, 15 years ago, as servers started to become commodities, instead of being this proprietary chip and this proprietary operating system, we started relying on Linux and Intel. And unsurprisingly, prices dropped. And we realized, hang on a sec here, the server is not actually our constraining resource, it's us. We're the expensive part of the equation. And so things like Heroku and AWS and App Engine and Cloud Foundry and Azure started popping up and we realized you know, a shared server is actually a problem here. This is more trouble than it's worth. Instead of treating our servers like pets that we want to cherish and, and heal if they get sick, we want to treat them like cows. Now, if you've ever been in a large cattle operation, you realize they don't give the cows names. They get numbers. And if number 15 gets sick, you rarely spend much money making 15 better. You put 15 down and you get a new instance of 15. Rinse, repeat. Now, that's not always the case. I actually grew up on a hobby farm and so we had a couple of dozen longhorn cows. They were pets for us, so they, all, they did have pithy names. Although some of them we named as a reminder of what was gonna happen in the fall, you know, just to keep everybody on the right path as to where, where this was gonna end. We had one cow, we actually called her Houdini because she knew how to get in and out of the pen, like at will. She could just like get in, she never went anywhere because she wasn't dumb. She realized that's where food was, that's where mom was, I'm not gonna go too far. But the, the first time we realized this, I was, I was sitting in my living room and, and I had like this presence over the back of my shoulder and I look and here's this 300 pound calf standing on the back porch just staring at me like, can I come inside? It's like, no. Very cute cow though. Now, again, on most cattle operations, that's not how it works. 
And so what we're starting to realize now is we need to treat our servers like these disposable commodities. We need to have greater automation. We need things to be done the same way every time. And so tools like Chef and Puppet and Bosch started to appear. And you started hearing terms like infrastructure as code. Because let's be honest, human beings are incapable of doing the same thing twice. That's just not our thing. You don't believe me? Go try playing golf. All right? It's my favorite example. I love golf. It's my favorite sport, but it drives you nuts. My wife calls it the stupid game, and I don't, I don't disagree with her in many days. But we just can't repeat. Now, that's fine for a sport. That's fine for a hobby. It's not good for software. We need consistency. The beauty of a script is it will do the same thing every single time. It won't cut corners. It won't skip a step. It's going to do what you tell it to do every single time, period. Now, that's great because all of a sudden our lead times drop because it's not artisanal, because a human doesn't make a mistake and have to wipe it out and start over again. The script's just going to do its thing. We started to speed the process up and we decided, you know what, maybe a three-month lead time isn't appropriate. And, and some of that, quite frankly, was a reaction to what was happening in the public cloud. And what many organizations had sort of crop up in the early era of AWS and whatnot was shadow ops. A team decides, you know what, I can't wait three months or six months for my internal IT organization to do its thing. I'm gonna do it my way. I'm gonna go ahead and spin an instance up and I can do that in just a few seconds and I hardly even need to use a credit card. I can probably just put it all on my corporate card. No one's even going to notice. So that forced a lot of internal IT organizations to grapple with that and decide that, okay, we need to have greater automation. This is kind of the first foray into the cloud. And in some organizations, this was actually full-on self-service on demand. Now, when I first experienced this, it was the same process, just faster. Now, a bunch of technologies enabled this. Of course, virtualization was a huge part of it. You put an abstraction over that physical compute resource. You use a hypervisor to manage all those VMs. And now we've got a coarser grained component to work with. And this is still useful for us today. It's still helpful to have that level of flexibility. There are still times where it's like, I need that level of control. But of course, when I go down that path, I'm also signing up for a maintenance agreement because I'm responsible for the care and feeding of that thing moving forward. And so anytime we do more work, we need to ask ourselves, is that something I really wanna do? And we need to constantly go back to Uncle Ben, paraphrasing, with great power comes great responsibility. Now again, there are times where that's absolutely what we want, but at this point in computing history, that should never be your first thought. It should be something that we have to get to because we exhausted all other options. Now that said, this is fundamentally the base layer of cloud. Because despite what people say, there are still servers there. It's just someone else is responsible for maintaining them. Now on top of that, we often will use containers. And for most people, when you say the word container, they immediately think of Docker. And there's a lot of confusion over what Docker is or isn't. I like to think of it quite simply as a box. So it is fundamentally an instance of a shipping container. If you think back to how we used to ship goods before the shipping container, it was a very manually intensive job. You have a whole bunch of people to carry things on and off the boat at both ends. It took a lot of time. It made it more difficult. Shipping container, turns out these are all the exact same size, and you put whatever you want in the shipping container, and a person with a crane takes the thing, puts it on a ship. You get to the other end, another crane takes it, pulls it off, drops it on the back of a semi, and away it goes. Turns out that's pretty useful. It gives you some really interesting efficiencies. So we get the same concept when we use Docker, because I can put whatever I want inside that box. And so now my application has absolutely everything it needs to run. It has the code, it has the system libraries, executables, environment variables, settings, et cetera, whatever it needs. And that lives in that box. And so now instead of me handing you code that you deploy to an instance of an app server, I say, no, here's this box, just run it for me. Don't worry about what's inside of it. And again, how often have you had this wonderful experience where this didn't match that region? And so with a container, instead of copying code, we're gonna just define what that environment is and move that thing from region to region. And frankly, we typically don't move anything. We just update a routing table. It's gonna stay almost always on the same piece of hardware. Tell me, you know, our production environment might be different, but certainly our lower regions are generally just change where we have the URL pointing. This is not that different than a virtual machine. It's the same basic concept. It's just where are we virtualizing at? So is it at the OS level or the hardware level? 
Now, the flip side of this, and what a lot of people I don't think fully appreciate about Docker is, you need to tell Docker everything you need. That is on you to define. We typically create an image that we store on a repository somewhere that might be Docker Hub, that might be our own private sort of instance of Docker Hub. Now understand that there are a lot of really fascinating things on Docker Hub, but that is community driven, which means it's not vetted. It's not curated. People can put literally whatever they want out there. So be careful if you pull turn my computer into part of your botnet. Probably not a great idea. Now, of course, there is the Docker store, which does exactly what you think it does. It gives you a curated, vetted place where people are allowed to sell an image. And so obviously, this is something that people have backed. There's usually a support contract that comes along with it. These are commercial entities. These are images that have been approved by Docker. And so you know you've got some level of support baked into this because it's coming from a major third-party provider. And yes, they generally want money for goods. That comes along with the territory here. Now, there are also some images that are Docker certified, and there are some images that come directly from Docker. Now, again, this is just an instance of a registry. That's all we're really talking about. There are other instances of registry as well, and people certainly can set up their own private you know, in repositories. That's very common. The challenge here is how do you manage all your images? You know, and one of the things that, that I see more often than not is a thousand flowers bloom. And for every application, you seemingly have your own unique instance of a Docker container, even if they're all very similar applications. Because it's so easy to customize, it makes it very easy and likely that you will customize it. And then you have to worry about, well, what happens when we need to do an upgrade? What happens when we need to do an update? You know, now, an image is just a recipe, a template, whatever you want to call it. Now, in general, you're going to customize an existing image you know, there's usually a parent image involved that you're going to essentially inherit or descend from. But again, you are responsible for the care and feeding of that box. And it's not impossible, it's just you need to understand the work that comes along with that. It's not free. You know, it's fascinating to me how many people seem to think the status quo is free. It's not. You, know, you go down this path, there is an additional maintenance burden that comes along with it. So again, think about Uncle Ben. With great power comes great responsibility. The challenge for many of us in these environments is how do we stay current? What happens when there's a critical vulnerability that gets patched? How do I sort of turn the crank and get new instances of those images built so that I'm not vulnerable to that? You know, I think at this point, everybody in IT is familiar with Equifax, whether you want to be or not. And, and as a longtime Java person, I've always kind of pondered, like, what's worse, the fact that you know, they, they left an unpatched version of Struts running in production for however many months, or the fact they were still running struts in production. I mean, I, I can argue either one of those, to be brutally honest with you. Now, I think Equifax is actually probably happy with the fact that they've been shoved aside as the largest hack ever. We can now lay that at the feet of Exactus, yet another company that most of us have probably never heard of, yet it has lots and lots of data about most of us. That's a little frightening. I, I really truly believe that if the average person understood how large of a digital profile they had in the world, their heads would just explode. You know, and I've tried to explain this to some people. And they just, they just if, if you don't come from our world, it just doesn't quite resonate. You know, and it's just stunning to me how much information people like willingly hand over every single day. Now, what's really interesting now, interesting in the, you know, the, the worst version of that word, some of the bugs we're starting to see are really low level and really hard for us to just patch over. And what do we do about some of these kind of issues? And again, this is where having a little higher level of abstraction becomes a win because we let somebody else deal with these. Now, in today's world, I can't talk about containers without saying the word Kubernetes. Kubernetes, otherwise known as K8s, it deploys, scales, manager containers. This comes out of Google. And so, as I like to say, this isn't their first rodeo. They have an awful lot of experience knowing how to manage large pools of, of compute. And so it's got the features you would expect out of anything in this space, self-healing, scaling, service discovery, load balancing, automated rollouts, automated rollbacks. And this all boils down to cube cuddle. That's what we work with as developers. Some people refer to this as cube control. Some people call it cube CTL. Some people call it cube cuddle. Some people call it cube cuddle. Your mileage may vary. I, I was talking to a friend of mine about this earlier this year, and he basically just kind of shrugged his shoulders and said, I don't know, I alternate between them just depending on how often I'm saying it. It's like, 
Great. So it's, it hasn't apparently reached a tabs versus spaces level of, of sort of fervor, but your mileage may vary. This is just the, the command line for Kubernetes. And so what I think is kind of neat about Kubernetes is you tell Kubernetes, this is what I'd like. I want three pods. And so say, oh, okay, cool. I'll make that happen. Hey, look, one of the pods got sick. I killed it. I'm going to bring another one up because you told me you wanted three of them. And I go in and say, you know what? I need to scale up because we've got some more demand. So make that five. Hey, no problem. I'll move it up to five. And I say, yeah, you know demand's over. Turn it back to three. And it just takes care of all that for me. So insert your favorite Captain Picard reference here. Now, there's a lot of different abstractions that come up in the Kubernetes space, pod, service, volume, namespace. A pod's just something that houses a container. All right, this is kind of your low level of abstraction. This is where your storage lives. This is where unique IPs live. You can think about this as your unit of deployment. You can think about this essentially as an instance of your application. Now, this is usually going to be a Docker container, but Kubernetes is agnostic. It doesn't care. There are other, other container formats. And while it is very, very common to have one container per pod, occasionally you have a situation where these two containers are really tightly bound to one another. I want them to be able to communicate easily. I don't want them to have to essentially go out and come back in the front door in order to exchange messages. And so sometimes we'll put multiple containers in a pod so they can share resources and talk directly to one another. These helpers are generally referred to as sidecars. Now at this point in our computing life, everybody has a K8s option. There's GKE from Google, there's Amazon's EKS and Fargate, there's Kubernetes on Azure, there's PKS, there really are no shortage of options here. I have to stress, most people getting a Kubernetes cluster up and running is fairly easy. It's the day two operations, it's the care and feeding of that Kubernetes cluster that tends to kind of bite people. You know, so how do we handle a new version of Kubernetes came out? It is not as simple as we'd like it to be. Now that said, it's a great set of primitives for us, us to work with, and that's a huge step forward. Now right now, I would argue the sort of finest granularity we have is this serverless concept. Now, to paraphrase Ferris Bueller, life moves pretty fast. We've seen this shift from IaaS to CAS to application platforms, and now we're talking about FAS and serverless. And I hate to say it, but serverless is not a great name because guess what? There's actually servers there. Who knew? It's not, in fact, magic unicorns that just you know, sprouts out of their head. That's not how it works. There's still physical hardware somewhere. It's just we don't care about it because it's somebody else's responsibility. I'm not in charge of provisioning. I'm not in charge of scaling. I'm not in charge of updating. Someone else is. Now, it's important to understand that Sam's absolutely right about the fact that there's a lot more layers involved here. And every one of those layers is something that we need to make sure gets patched. There's more moving parts now than there used to be. Now, this tweet had a great response from, from my friend Josh, who said, you're right, but that's why we have Cloud Foundry. That's why we have the public cloud offerings so that somebody else can be responsible for that. You don't have to worry about it. You can worry about your application or your function. Let someone else handle the, that undifferentiated heavy lifting. Now, it's important to understand these are all just abstractions. And so at the very bottom of this whole pool, we've got IaaS. Now, how do we provision hardware quickly, easily in an automated fashion? We can use containers in which case our job is to bring the container to the party and we're responsible for maintaining that. The environment will give us scheduling and networking and routing and metrics. When I move to a platform, the container is provided for me. It comes along for the ride. All I have to worry about is the application. What is my business problem that I'm trying to solve? And then that platform gives us images and networking and marketplace and quota and monitoring. Now we go to the serverless side of the equation I don't even have to worry about an application anymore. I just have to worry about a function. This might be five, 10, 15 lines of code. This is a lot less for me to deal with. Container, I don't have to worry about that at all. I don't have to worry about how the function executes, how it scales, how it binds to that event stream. That's somebody else's job. So the only real difference here is what is it that I'm responsible for as a developer versus what am I getting from a platform? What is someone else doing for me? So every one of these has value for us. The challenge, the art, is what goes in what bucket? Because you can't get everything in one. I'm sorry, that's just not the best way to go. You know, I, again, I had somebody say earlier, you know, a couple weeks ago, a month ago, whatever it was, I'm gonna refactor my entire application as a series of functions. You know, that, that's like the classic example of, you know, hold my beer and see what happens. 
Now, again, these are just different levels of abstraction. So another way of thinking about this, kind of the layer cake model. So we've got hardware. There's always hardware there somewhere. Again, it's just maybe it's somebody else's data center. You don't have to worry about installing it. We use IaaS to make provisioning easier. We might use containers for some of our application workloads, especially it works great for legacy stuff that we're not going to modernize. Platforms for, for maybe more of our mission critical things that's worth an investment in making that transition to cloud native. And then serverless for where it really shines in terms of, of how we do kind of these more asynchronous one-off kind of things. Now, the lower down this hierarchy I go, I have a lot more flexibility. At the hardware level, I can do whatever I want. There's a lot fewer standards. There's a lot more for me to do, a lot more for me to manage. If I go up that hierarchy, it's a lot less complex. I mean, talk about writing five lines of code versus maintaining a bespoke artisanal hardware environment. I get a lot more operational efficiency. If you've got this artisanal environment, you might need a whole fleet of people to maintain it. If it's a platform, you might be able to get by with four or six or eight. So the general advice that I tend to give people is push as many workloads as possible up the stack. You want to use the highest level of abstraction you can, realizing that not everything is going to fit in serverless. Not everything is going to fit in a platform. Not everything is going to fit in a container. Now, there is some argument that FAS is the new PaaS, and obviously there's a ton of different options here. You know, Lambda kind of kicked this party off a few years ago, but everybody's got an abstraction now, of Azure Functions, Google Cloud Functions, Knative, Riff, I'll show you that here in a little bit, Kubeless Vision, OpenWhisk. I mean, this definitely suffers from the shiny new thing curse. You know, developers, we have this tendency to kind of be like dogs chasing squirrels. You know, it's like, ooh, blockchain, ooh, machine learning. Well, Kubernetes, and we just sort of chase after it, you know, in our effort to practice resume-driven design. And so we have to be a little cautious here. Thank you. A lot of people get caught up in, I read a white paper, and this company that I really respect and like and wish we were more like is doing this, and so we need to do it. Please watch out for the lemming effect here. All right, it's very easy to jump off this cliff and not realize that it's a bad fit for you. Now, I would argue FAS is basically a subset of serverless. This is where we get a little pedantic over our language. I don't think it's super useful. I use the terms interchangeably generally. I don't, I don't get too caught up in specific definitions. But I want to stress, there's some really powerful reasons to use these platforms. In some cases, it's because you've got data already with one of the providers. You know, so you, maybe you've got a bunch of stuff sitting in S3 and you want to iterate over it or do some analysis on it. Well, that's usually a pretty good use of a function. You know, maybe there's either something tactical or strategic you want to leverage from one of the providers, you know, maybe you want to do some machine learning with Google. You know, again, that's typically a spot where these functions tend to shine. It's not just a new way to cloud. What's so powerful about serverless is we get some really crazy efficiency gains. So we get some development efficiencies because now we're even further up that abstraction. All I have to do is worry about the, the implementation details of five or 10 or 15 lines of code. And that gets me out of the business of having to worry about what operating system would you say we're running on? You know, I mean, how many of you actually know the exact distribution of the operating system you're running on, the exact patch level? I mean, I don't think that's something we should ever really care about. I would rather, as a developer, focus on solving business problems. That's, that's what gets our customers happy. That's when they bake us a cake. You know, and so we need to think about what's the value line for us? And how do we get out of this business of undifferentiated heavy lifting? How do we focus on solving business problems, not plumbing issues like, oh, hey, the servers all need to be upgraded? We get some real serious resource efficiencies here because one of the beautiful aspects of functions is if your function has not been called for some period of time, we can blow the container away and now you're paying nothing because you're not using any resources. A request comes in, we'll spin up a container and there will be a cold start penalty there. Depending on how much resource you need, it, it might be noticeable. Although I would argue if latency is your issue, you're using the wrong abstraction. Because think about doing a batch run. You're going through a million records. If the first instance takes three seconds and every instance after that is 300 milliseconds, who cares? If you're doing a password update or you update your address, or your phone number, and you're going to send your customer an email saying, hey, did you update your password, or your phone number, or your address? If so, ignore this email. Otherwise, please contact support. Who cares whether they get that five seconds after it's updated or a minute or two minutes or five minutes? You know, latency is not the issue there. Now, a lot of people seem to equate functions with free. They're not. The first million or two might be. You get a pretty generous free tier, although it does not take long to roll through a million transactions. And of course, there's a huge asterisk at the end of it, which is additional fees may apply. 
Now, the actual cost is this strange fractional number. Depending on the provider, you'll see different numbers. And you also get tagged for data transfer fees and any other service you happen to leverage. But basically what it boils down to is it's some fractional cost based on the how many requests did you send, how long did it take to process that request, and how much resource did you need to process it. You don't get unlimited resource. You don't get to say, I want 100 gigs. You, most of them have a limit and it's fairly small because again, we shouldn't need a lot of room for a function. It's five, 10, 15, 20 lines of code, not 10,000 lines do everything. It can be hard to figure out how much that actually costs. You're gonna to need to get a spreadsheet probably to figure it out but it's one of the most cost effective ways we have of doing this. You get some really good operational efficiency. Some people refer to this as serverless ops because again, it's a lot less for us to worry about. We let the platform do that. There's a bunch of different use cases that fit here. Anything that's evolving rapidly, anything that's stateless, you don't really have a good sense of what the request pattern looks like. It's either very infrequent or sporadic. The scaling needs kind of all over the map. We don't have a nice predictable curve. Asynchronous is your friend here, things we can parallelize. You see this an awful lot in IoT, machine learning, batch processing, almost all the conversational UIs, that's basically what you're doing is writing a set of functions. A lot of the CI, CD automation people are doing these days is being done as a function. A lot of backend stuff with your, your web stack can be done as functions these days. Monitoring, notification, alerting. You know, it, it's a very, very valuable tool. But I cannot stress this enough, it is not, in fact, the answer for every workload you've ever got, sorry. You know, and, and again, the, the point that I really try to hammer home to people is if it's latency sensitive, don't use serverless. You know, I know a lot, it's, it's, it's kind of in fashion right now to say Java's really slow, Spring's really slow. If you think Spring is slow, Dave Sire did a presentation at Spring one a couple weeks ago showing how fast Spring actually can be. And in some of the instances, it's almost impossible to register how fast it's going. You know, so if, if you're worried about the startup experience. Quite honestly, the language choice is not the issue. It's you are attempting to use serverless in a space where it's not a good fit. All right, that shouldn't be a shock to any of you. Now, I'm actually gonna skip over Spring Cloud Functions because I do wanna actually show you guys this, but I wanna talk about what Riff is first. So what is Riff? Riff is based on top of Knative. Knative is basically an answer to the fragmentation in the function space. So to steal some language from the Knative website, it's basically a platform for build deploy and how do we manage these modern serverless workloads or the way Riff phrases that same term, set of APIs that allow you to deploy these serverless style functions, applications, and containers. In a nutshell, it's middleware. That allows you to run this stuff anywhere, takes care of orchestrating, management, routing, all that kind of fun stuff, allows you to scale up and scale down as necessary. It is, in a nutshell, an agnostic layer for FAS. I don't care what platform you want to run it on. Run it anywhere, run it on-prem, run it locally, run it in any of the cloud providers. That's the whole point here. Now this is built on top of Kubernetes and Istio, and there's three major building blocks that Knative gives us. There's the build phase. This is the pluggable model for actually building containers. Again, containers don't have to be a Docker container. The whole goal is to make this part of your CI CD pipeline. There's a bunch of different build methods. So it does not have to be a Docker file. It could be a build pack, it could be you know, Conoco. It, it's totally up to you, whatever makes sense. There's four primary aspects to the build. Where would you say the source code's located? What would you like me to do with that? What are the steps necessary to build it? What account is actually gonna execute that? And then I need access to some stuff while we're doing the build. Obviously, another major building block of any FAS would be eventing. How do we publish and subscribe? How do we get information to the, the functions that are, are interested in it? So this is really an abstraction over the event stream. Don't worry about the underlying platform. That ends up being a Knative custom resource. And this is basically called, well, this is called a channel. You can think of it as a topic if you want. And then there's a bus that actually is the underlying provider of that pub sub concept, whether that's Kafka or Rabbit, doesn't really matter it looks a little something like this. So you publish to a channel, the channel is this abstraction on top of the underlying messaging technology, and then your app, your function, et cetera, talks to that channel. And of course, it can route things back to a different channel, you know, that be picked up by another function or another application. You know, this, this goes you know, as far as you wanna take it. And then of course, there's the serving aspect of this. How do we scale up? How do we scale down? So when we see some extra lag, we want some additional pods to take care of that. So let's go ahead and spin those up. 
hey, look, I'm not seeing much demand right now. I can go ahead and shut down maybe all of these resources. And so where appropriate, we'll get down to zero. Now, this also uses this concept of revision control. So Istio is the networking aspect of it. And so it can route to multiple instances of the same function, provided they are different versions, AKA a different revision. So this is how you can handle zero downtime deploys, blue, green, et cetera. Now I've already told you about Kubernetes. I've already told you about Docker. Those are all the pieces here. All right. So let's tempt the demo gods and see what happens. So what I've got going here, get my mouse over there. This is Riff running on GKE. So you can see there's a whole bunch of stuff in there. Istio, a bunch of K-native things. Uh, what else is interesting in there? There's some you know, Kubernetes stuff as well. Imagine that. And so what we're going to do is I'm going to run this command. Riff. Make sure I get it right. Do, 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 do. So this is the function we're actually going to execute. So you can see this is just a little basic bit of JavaScript. We're going to square the number. I think everybody kind of gets that. I know it's not the most amazing demo ever, but work with me. OK, so what we're going to do is we're going to create a new function. It's node. It's a JavaScript. We're going to call it square. We're going to get that code from a GitHub repo. The artifact that tells me information about it also lives in that repo. It's called package.json. And I want you to push this image up to the Google Container Registry. And then wait just says, you know, chill out. So what I want you to do is watch in the background here, right up at the very top in this watch command here, you're going to see some stuff pop up. So there is square. Now it's, it's going to build this guy, or it's going to try anyway. I guess we'll see what happens. Demo gods. Do, do, do. Oh, yes. Love it. Build square, fail to finish. Well, that's fantastic. The funny thing is, I literally did this an hour ago, and it worked. So I, you know, want want. Oh, that's right. I got to delete it first. Uh, let's see. Make sure I get that command right. Type in the wrong thing. Ref service delete. Okay. So how about we try that one more time? The function create wait. Square init O of four. That's already looking a little better. OK, so now it's actually running through the steps of how do I build this function. So I'm going to go out. I'm going to build the container, mush my code into that container, push it up to the registry. And then once that's all done, it's actually going to launch it in the same place you see right here where it's doing this init part right here. This is eventually going to go away. And it'll be replaced with actually three instances of the pod that's running the function we just wrote, the one we're leveraging here. Now, of course, that could be Java. That could be all sorts of different languages. JavaScript is just as trivial as anything. OK, there we go. It actually completed. Now, let's poke this thing and see what happens. So we're going to clear that. So let's do riff service invoke. So I'm going to poke it, and I'm going to say 4, and it's going to give me back 16. Do it again. Try 9, 81. So hey, look at that. You can do some math. Isn't that fascinating? Now, honestly, you're not going to poke your function like this. That's not terribly meaningful. It's going to listen to a topic. And once a message comes in, it will react to that message and then write something else out to a topic or do some other thing, whatever it happens to be. But, but that's the general idea here. All right. And then eventually, it would say, hey, you know what? I haven't gotten a request on this in a while, so I can go ahead and terminate those containers. I don't need to have those just sitting around running. So all right. Now, the million dollar question, I get this all the time, is, well, which of these abstractions should I use of all these options? There are three answers to every question you've ever been asked in computer science. 42. Yeah, that's the geek check to see who's read Hitchhiker's Guide. My favorite approach as an architect is another layer of abstraction. Always put another layer of abstraction in there. It's always a good idea. And of course, the answer that I rely on most in my current role is, well, it depends. And I realize that for a lot of folks, this is a very vague and unsatisfying answer. It's like, but give me the answer. Don't, don't make me think. The reality is we have to have a conversation. And I never mean it depends as the shutting down of the conversation. I mean it as the beginning of the conversation. Let's talk about it. Tell me about your environment. Tell me about your challenges. Tell me about your application. There is no one answer here. There is no one magic hammer to unite them all. 
This is the very embodiment of and not or. What I find so frustrating is that if you hired a carpenter to come out and do some work for you, and that person, if they showed up with one hammer and they said, I use this hammer for everything, you'd ask them to leave. If you go to a home improvement store, there's an entire aisle of hammers. They're all different. Now, I will admit, I'm a software person, so I have one hammer is more than enough for me to screw up all sorts of problems, but when I hire a professional, the reason I'm hiring them is because they know when to use which hammer. So if I expect that a carpenter is going to know the difference between a sledgehammer and a finishing hammer and a, and a framing hammer, well, why am I going to my clients and saying, I only have one abstraction? This is the one answer I bring to every party. That's just as inappropriate for us. So I hate to say it, but not everything fits in each of these buckets. Like anything in software, there are trade-offs. This is not a brilliant statement. The thing we need to understand, and I keep emphasizing this point, is with great power comes great responsibility. So again, the further down that abstraction hierarchy I am, the more complexity there is for my developers. Now we gotta start thinking about operating systems and patch levels and upgrades. I'd much rather focus on pushing apps. We need to think about the prod op side of the house. We need to ask ourselves, how many operators do we want supporting all this? And so it's this balance, it's this tension between flexibility and standardization. And what frustrates me is to see how many people look at guardrails and they say guardrails are shackles. They're not, they're there to protect you. Now, I, I don't know if you guys, if any of you watch like the Tour de France, but watching these guys bomb down these mountains at crazy speeds, and then you see like, if they go off the edge of the cliff, they're just like gone. I'm thinking, I kind of like to have a guardrail there. You know, and that's part of the way we have to look at these things is they're there to help us. There's nothing wrong with that. We need to ask ourselves, how do we want to allocate our resources? And we need to think through the problem and ask ourselves, what's the right fit here? What is the right tool to bring to bear? Now, as I mentioned earlier, I could, if I wanted to, take a screw and pound it into a board. It is not going to end well for anyone. The hammer, the screw, the board, it's, it's not a good outcome, but it will work with enough determination. The challenge for us is picking the right tool in the right place. And so Richard Schroeder, one of, one of my friends, tweeted this out recently, and I think it's, it's a good thing to remember. These are not zero-sum games. There is not one runtime to rule them all. The challenge for us is knowing what's the right fit for this particular problem that's in front of us today. Or to once again quote Dave, you know, this is the reality. It's all of these things. Now again, I would advise you to push as many workloads as possible up the abstraction hierarchy. That's in your best interest. And you need to understand fundamentally, this is a heavily evolving space. Riff has changed dramatically from when I first started playing with it back in the winter. And it will continue to change. I mean, it's, I think, 0.13 right now. So do not put that in production. I should not have to stress that. This is the reality, though. Things are moving really fast. So yes, Riff is a very new product. There's a whole bunch of good videos out there on it. Uh, you guys will get the slides, so you don't have to worry about all these links. But there is a good podcast about Riff. There's been a couple interesting aspects on serverless spring. There's been sort of the introduction for Riff is for functions. Dave just did a discussion at spring one about cloud abstractions, functions, containers. And then of course there's what now changes with Knative. And there were, I think half a dozen or so presentations at spring one just on Knative, Riff, et cetera. So there's a lot of good information out there on that. Again, the challenge for us is knowing when to use which tool and understanding that these are all valuable for us to have in our toolkit. Good luck. Thank you guys so much for hanging out with me. I really appreciate it. Enjoy your evening. Go get something to drink.